is an awfully short dress you got there. Oh, <laughs> I have shorts on because it's a really short dress. And yes, I have worn this out. And when I drop things, no, I didn't bend over. Cheeky. Jackie, why are we dressed like this? Because it's Halloween. It's Halloween, it's Halloween, which means it's my birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Except when we recorded this, it's not my birthday. You mean it's not Halloween? Then I want to go trick or treating. Well, Jackie, who's way too old to go trick or treating, uh, that is not going to happen today. <laughs> <laughs> or on actual Halloween. You don't know me. I think trick-or-treating would be fun for adults if it was like, here's alcohol. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, guys, to True Crime. Wait, oh my god. <laughs> you said true crime, so I said true crime. All right, let me not sit with my legs open. <laughs> Welcome back to Two Girls and One Crime. Not cap. Halloween episode. <laughs> Both our own interpretations of what that could have meant. We're the Scooby Doo family. <laughs> Zoinks. Zoinks. My name is Vita. I'm Jackie. And we're very happy to have you back. Hey, Freddy. Hey, hey Shaggy. Shaggy, stop <laughs> licking your balls. I love you. Oh, now he licks my face. You want to get this off? It's a little tight on her. You're a good boy. He's stuck. Okay, be free. She's like, <sighs> So I'm, who am I? I'm Daphne. Daphne, you're Thelma. Velma. Oh, fuck. You're really bad at this. Oh, my God, I swear I watch Scooby-Doo all the time. <laughs> and Quinn is Sailor Moon. <laughs> <laughs> you tried to find a Freddy outfit? Okay, so here's what happened. I tried to get a Freddy outfit, but I couldn't find one. So I thought, well, maybe like a little sailor outfit, because he wears a white shirt with a blue collar and a little red, you know, thing. But... I ordered it from like some company in China for like ten dollars. So I got a medium because I thought Quinn is a medium size, and it's very tiny. No, the rule of thumb about ordering from China is every you have to get everything way bigger, like two sizes yeah, bigger. Yeah, three, four. <laughs> but I did put this on Cat. What do you think, Cat? All right, guys. So just really quick, I want to mention this. Um, check if you have notifications turned on on your YouTube settings because if you don't, that's the reason why you never get emails notifying you when we've released a new episode. Oh, you sound like you're yelling at them. Really? Yeah. Hey guys, everybody remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you like us and show us support and don't forget to turn on your notifications so that you know every time we drop a new episode. Okay, that was much nicer. We also have a Patreon which is really fun because we release content every week. And it is behind the scenes. It's mm -hmm. funny outtakes. Join us because we will give you all that extra special attention that you desire. So let's do the thing. Okay, so it's a Halloween episode. Did mm -hmm. you choose something that has to do with Halloween? Mm, kind of, but not specifically. I did more of like a, uh, I got inspired by like a house. Ooh, a haunted house. Ooh. <laughs> what are we eating today? We ordered some Mediterranean food. Shawarma, lamb stuff, and chicken stuff, and... Uh, falafel stuff. Get in my belly. Oh, the Brussels sprouts are so good. The pita is really good too. Mm. I'm gonna break some of my diet real quick. I love mushrooms. Oh my god, these are the best. Yeah. If I could make love to a vegetable, it would be this. I want some hummus too. Okay. Okay, so you chose a story mm. about a house. It doesn't have the reputation as a haunted house, but I think it should. Mmm. Well, thank you for bringing something new to our channel, darling. Yeah, well, last year we did that terrible, terrible story. <laughs> yeah. The last Halloween episode. Yeah. Oh, Toolbox killers. Gut wrenching. Never really want to think about that case again. No. I think that was like one of the more damaging ones that made me go, mm, what are we doing? Yep. This is uh, also not great, but you know, that's why we're here. So this one's not funny? It's nope. a gas. You don't have bangs. These are so annoying. I love my bangs. <laughs> you ready? Oh, you ready? <laughs> 10 Rillington Place. That's the name of the story. Mm -hmm. Young newlyweds would move into a Notting Hill flat with dreams of raising their daughter in their first home. But soon after, they would realize that married life was not as blissful as they had hoped, and they had no idea of the horrors that would befall them in the haunted walls of 10 Rillington Place. Should I read this in a British accent? The home that sat on Tenbrillington Place was a brick, which 
which version of English is that? That's like Essex. The home that sat at 10 Rillington Place was a brick, three-storey, end-of-terrace property. No, do crack me. The home that sat at the 10 Rillington Place was a brick, three-storey, end-of-terrace <laughs> property. <laughs> You're not over black, but it yeah. works. <laughs> I think the first one I did was Cockney, but I just said <laughs> I Essex. Because <laughs> Essex is more like... The home is not a tiny place with brick. Like, it's really, uh, really yeah, yeah, hard yeah. to understand Essex accents. Because when I was a waitress, I had some people from Essex come in and they're like, Yeah, no, this will have an upside and then this side and then this me. And I was like, well, What the fuck are you saying? <laughs> you sound more British when you're not actually speaking British, but you're just imitating them. <laughs> that was very Essexy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the home. That sat at 10 Rillington Place was a brick, three-story, end-of-terrace property, built in 1870, and was split into three small flats in Notting Hill. There were three different living apartments. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> On the ground floor lived John Christie and his wife, Ethel. The middle floor was an elderly widower named Mr. Kitchener. Oh, there's a Kitchener in Canada that I'm always quoting. Random. Yeah. Okay. Like a person? No, it's a place. I'm always quoting truckloads. Two in front. Oh, that's what you meant by quoting. Yep. I thought you were like saying quotes that someone named Mr. Kitchener said. <laughs> I was like, that's obscure. <laughs> and in 1948, a young couple named Timothy Evans and his pregnant wife, Beryl, moved into the top floor of the building. Intentionally, I call it ground floor, middle floor, top floor. Okay. Because uh, the UK, apparently, they call it ground floor, first floor, Zero. second floor. It's floor zero. Well, ground floor zero. Floor, yeah. yeah. And then they say first floor, second floor. So I was really confused yeah. for like the first half an hour of researching this. Yeah. <laughs> and then I realized what that all meant. Yeah, it's so weird. So zero. it's like second floor is actually U.S. third floor. Mm -hmm. You hear that, Brits? Brits. Oh Although, actually, no, I take that back. It does make sense when you say I'm one floor up or I'm two floors up. Timothy John Evans was born on November 20th, 1924, in Wales, to a loving mother, Thomas Cena. But his father had already abandoned the family before his birth, after having fathered a daughter with her three years earlier. So, so he's an older sister. He is a piece of shit. <laughs> As a child, Timothy had difficulty learning and struggled with school, with an estimated IQ around 70. At the age of eight, he developed a rash version of tuberculosis on his foot that required time away from school for treatments, which even further set Timothy back. This is the guy who got married and <laughs> starting a life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like he's a loser. It's... He's not, like, the smartest guy. But... He's a lover. You can still be husband material. No. But not be able to read a book. Literacy. Meh. In 1935, at the age of 11, his mother and second husband, Probert, interesting name, Moved to London, where Timothy worked as a painter and decorator while attending school. Mm. Probert was the last name, but I don't know the first name of the husband. Got it. Mr. Probert. Okay. It appears that he dropped out at 13 when he left home and briefly worked in the coal mines, but had to resign due to problems with his foot. Damn. Tuberculosis foot. By the time he reached adulthood, he had low literacy skills and self-esteem. He would often invent stories about himself to boost his image and confidence. Well, he was creative. Such as telling people that his father was an Italian count. <laughs> However, this would falter his credibility by others when discovered to be lies. He would already have crimes on his record for stealing a car and driving without insurance or license. By what time did he already have them? Um, just like adulthood. In 1939, he would move back in with his mother in London. And in 1946, they would move to Notting Hill. Only a two minute walk from 10 Rillington Place and find a steady job as a truck driver. Mm -hmm. Now that's a good job. <laughs> Gotta respect the truck drivers. Females, males, mostly the females though. I think it'd be interesting to be a truck driver for a minute. One of my um, good friends back from college, mm -hmm. he's a truck driver. Shout out to Trucker Dale. He used to come into our um, college bar that I used to work at. And after like four years of working there, we all just became friends. We'd all like hang out after the bar closed, Cute. go to my apartment afterwards and have like a party there because I lived a block away from the bar. A, a pool party? A pool party at like four in the morning. Did you live in like a cool apartment complex? You were allowed to go to the pool at 4 a.m.? No. Oh, I thought you said a pool party. Yeah, we would just all go drunk at like four in the morning to the pool. You know what the like thing that we used to do? We used to do underwater shots. Oh my god. So you take a bottle and then you like 
go underwater and you see how much that person can drink oh before they my have to come god up. jack dallas you're wild <laughs> In January 1949, Timothy Evans would be set up on a blind date where he would meet his future wife, Beryl Susanna Thorley. Mm -hmm. Cool name. Mm -hmm. Beryl. I want to say it in a British accent. Beryl. 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 All right, so Beryl was five years his junior from a middle-aged working class couple in South London. So you have to say your name in a South London accent. Is that like south, of, you know, like like southern people? Like, barrel. <laughs> <laughs> Enough silliness. She was the oldest of four and described as a pretty and petite girl with bright eyes, fair hair, and a button nose. And an angelic smile. However, her beauty belied an awkward stubbornness and immature temper. Wait, you're telling me the illiterate guy got the pretty girl? Mm -hmm. Growing up, money was always tight with a mother who worked as a housekeeper and her father who bounced from job to job as a patrol pump attendant. What you doing? I float sauce. And then I drop my mushroom. They were uprooted many times over the years and although their family was average, she would recall that there was little warmth or affection between her parents or her siblings. That sounds very English. Mm. She was born into the Great Depression and raised during the pockmarked bombings of World War II. In 1947, at the age of 17, she would meet 22-year-old Timothy Evans, a short, statured, 5'5", five five, handsome man with a thick mop of dark hair. A childish sense of fun and a vivid imagination. They had a whirlwind romance, and eight months later, on September 20th, 1947, they would get married, and she would move in with Timothy and his mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're attractive. Yeah. Yeah. They're no Kim Kardashian or Megan Fox. Did you see that picture of Kim Kardashian posing with, like, normal people? No. They look like just normal people. Okay. And she looks so... Not like a human. Artificial. She looks... Yeah. Not like a human. Pretty. It's weird when you see her on the red carpet. It's one thing. But then seeing her like... With in the wild. With people. With yeah. real complexions. And you're like, wow. She really looks like... A superhuman. Like a robot. Disproportional. I think when I see certain pictures of her, she looks really pretty. And then certain pictures, I'm like, oh, she looks really bizarre. Beryl was immediately accepted by his mother, stepfather, and two sisters, and she finally felt that she had found happiness with a loving family. The couple would live in the crowded family flat, squeezed into a back bedroom for one and a half years. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine. And during that time, they adjusted to married life and to each other. They were kindred spirits, for better or worse, both immature and loud. Choice words were exchanged, and things would get thrown. But all in all, they were a very normal couple who loved each other very much. I mean, they just sound really passionate. It sounds like they didn't have very good coping skills. Yeah. But at the same time, they were good people. That's what it strikes me as. Yeah. Uh. On October 14th, 1948, Beryl and Timothy would, be, would welcome a beautiful baby girl they named Geraldine. She was doted on and life was good, but they badly needed their own space. So with the blessings of the family and gift of new furniture from Thomasina, the young family moved into their first home together on the top floor of 10 Rillington Place. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is sad. This is already super sad. Mm -hmm. I, I, Cause I can see bad things are gonna happen to this sweet little couple. How many pieces of mushroom were they? Three. You got half of I had half of it. I'm moving on to the fruit phase of my diet. You don't want this mushroom? No, you can have it. Wow. Like, you made orgasms with your mouth when you were eating it before, so I thought... That's so good. I'd have to fight over this last piece. Not the case. The building was squalid, with grit on the windowsills from the factory next door, and flaked paint off the walls from years of neglect. The way up was a nightmare of stairs, lit and heated only by gas, and with a shared lavatory out back. Their flat was only comprised of a bedroom and kitchen. Just outside the window was an above-ground section of the underground, which was deafening as it passed by. But at a rent of only 12 shillings a week, estimated 172 pounds, or $200 a month, plus only minutes away from Thomasina, they relished having a place to call their own. That place was really run down. We didn't have a bathroom inside. We had to share the outhouse the lavatory. with everyone in the building. Was there only one place to poop? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's gross. I could not imagine living like that. Mm. <laughs> Three stars. <laughs> no, you have a shit, and you're like. <laughs> mm. Downstairs on the first floor lived John and Ethel Christie, a lovely, old-fashioned couple raised with Victorian standards. They were polite, moral, and kept the house orderly with strict rules and curfews. John Reginald Halliday Christie, preferred to be called Reg, and was a quiet, inconspicuous man with retreating ginger red hair and pale blue eyes. Beryl would say that he had a fatherly quality, kind, caring, and patient. He was an ex-special constable, an injured war hero, and had a wide knowledge of medicine, which Beryl would take comfort in as a blessing. He was like a medic as a veteran, so he wasn't like a um, doctor. He claims that he had on-the-field first aid training. Cool. That'd be better than not, I guess. He came from a large family, the sixth of seven children, and had a rough childhood being whipped by his harsh father and emasculated by overprotection by his mother. His siblings would also dominate over him, and as a result, he learned to exaggerate symptoms of injury and illness to attract attention. Oh my god. I feel like I did that as a kid. I think I always was like, I'm dying. Because <laughs> I was like, I want someone to love me. I'm fine, Dex. <laughs> Despite a difficult home life, like, Mommy, are you okay? he was, yeah, he's like, me, me, emotional what? again? <laughs> oh no. Despite a difficult home life, he was found to excel outside of it. He sang in a church choir and was a boy scout. He won a scholarship to Halifax Secondary School, where he enjoyed mathematics, history, and woodworking. He was later tested to have an IQ of 128. That's a lot more than Thomas. He was described as a queer lad without many friends who kept to himself. His peers would brand him Reggie, no dick, and can't do it Christy when he struggled with impotence as an adolescent, and these difficulties would be lifelong, often only being able to perform with prostitutes. Interesting. Mm -hmm. He got himself a wife, but he couldn't fuck her. But he could, he could fuck a woman he was paying. That reads not a physical thing. That's like a mental anxiety yeah, sort of thing. In 1916, Reg would enlist in the British Army and in 1917 was called in to join the 52nd Regiment to serve as an infantryman. He was dispatched to France where he would be injured in a mustard gas attack, landing him in a military hospital for a month and claimed to leave him blind and mute for three and a half years. Mustard gas, that's so intense. Jesus. He was demobilized from the army in October 1919. He would meet and marry Ethel Waddington Simpson on May 10th, 1920. Do you want a new drink? Yes. Nope. Their marriage was not a smooth one. His impotence remained and he continued to visit prostitutes. Early in their marriage, Ethel suffered a miscarriage. Reg would also have a difficult time freshly out of the military and would be convicted of several criminal offenses. His first job out was as a postman, and he would be convicted not only a month later for stealing postal orders, for which he served a three-month imprisonment sentence. Two years later, in 1923, he would be convicted for obtaining money on false pretenses and violent conduct, for which he was placed on probation for a year, and then imprisoned again for two counts of larceny. After only four years of marriage, John Reginald and Ethel Christie would separate. Ethel would move on, getting a job working as a typist at an engineering company and then later an electrical company, while Reg would spend the next decade in and out of prison for crimes that gradually escalated, including assault of his roommate at the time, a prostitute, hitting her over the head with a cricket bat. That's the most British thing I ever heard, though. A cricket bat? Yeah. <laughs> When he was released from prison again in January 1934, the couple reunited. He vowed to give up his petty crime ways and surprisingly would get accepted into the local police station as a volunteer member for the War Reserve Police, who did not perform any background check on him when he applied. Ethel herself was now 35 and agreed to give him another chance. How do you win someone back after that kind of rec like reckless? She must have been lonely... To take him back? Mm-mm. The two of them moved into 10 Rillington Place with their dog and cat. Their children. I can relate. However, the Christie's reunion was still far from ideal. 
he would still frequently visit with prostitutes and have an affair with a woman from work until her husband caught them in bed and beat him up. He sucks. Mm-mm. He's not a good husband. Ethel Christie was a portly lady in her early 50s with no children of her own, but warm and deeply maternal. She spent most of her life being a neat homebody who lived in her husband's shadow. She was described as submissive, weak, and malleable, and many suspected that she was secretly afraid of her husband. Beryl would reflect that having a new baby in the home was the only time that Ethel's eyes would light up. But the new life with a baby was a struggle for Beryl and Tim. Tim would get a job in July of 1949 working as a delivery driver for Continental Winehouse on a modest wage of seven pounds per week, about 275 pounds or $320 per week. However, he falsely claimed to his employer that Geraldine was gravely ill and begged for three pounds in advance, seven pounds to cover a doctor's bill and a further loan of 10 pounds, almost $1,000. Then his employee, Finding Tim's work unsatisfactory, fired him only two weeks after working. He did not tell Beryl any of this. And I doubt he paid back that loan. Secretly unemployed for weeks, as bills piled up, Tim would leave for work. And never missed a chance to, we did that at the same time, to booze with the boys at the local hotel bar. How was he affording this booze? However, he would lose his temper if Beryl had a girl's night out and left him home with the baby. Typical man. Tim would indulge heavily in his drinking, gambling, and lies. Okay, so the theme in this house is that the men fucking suck. (laughs) Feeling lonely and shut in, Beryl became depressed with the demands of motherhood and being a housewife. She was not a housewife. She was a flat a small, shitty flat wife. <laughs> just a, just a, the flat would fall into disarray. Meals would be skipped and Beryl would become neglectful with the baby. Thomasina would step in to babysit on Saturdays with the excuse to give Beryl a break. But it was really to give Geraldine a much-needed bath and wash her clothes. The couple would decide to take in a roommate, a 17-year-old, Lucy Endicott, who would help provide a little extra income and keep Beryl company. Tim found a well-paying managerial job at Haviland's Airlines, but it was in Hatfield, 20 miles north of London. Needing the money, Tim would pull out his best suit, freshly ironed shirt, polished shoes, and pack an overnight suitcase ready to leave on the first train out. But rather than staying overnight, Tim would return that night. Thomasina and Beryl had a funny feeling about this job, and after calling the airlines, they confirmed that there was... No job. They were furious. Lies. So what was he doing? Nobody knows. I don't know if these things off though. You don't like them? I'm just not used to them. Well, well, guys, it's Jackie again. Is that shocking? <laughs> Thelma, you look like Jackie now. Should I put it back on? Yeah. A week later on an evening out to the movies with Lucy, very cute, Beryl would spot Tim outside the KPH public house he frequented after a few drinks. The fight that ensued lasted all the way home with every home they passed flicking their lights on to see what the commotion was outside. Tim would snap at her for going out as Beryl would spit back, I told you I was going out. Witnesses would claim that they heard Tim say before the door slammed, I'll give you a good hiding for going to the pictures and leaving the baby. Your place is at home. Just you wait till I get you inside. Suddenly, Mm -hmm. he's become Southern. (laughs) (laughs) I'll give you a good hiding? What does Mm, that mean? I I don't know. Maybe hiding? Oh, like maybe hitting? I'll give you a good hiding. I don't know what that accent is. but (laughs) Anyways, once inside, the fight would escalate. Tim would slap Beryl, and she would grab a bread knife cornered by a window. He would threaten to push her through the window. Thankfully, Thomasina would intervene before anyone was badly hurt. Lucy would be asked to leave. <laughs> Surprised Lucy was still there. The police would show up and statements would be made. The marriage was irrevocably broken. The next day, Beryl would confide in Ethel that she was going to have a separation. Beryl had become close to the Christies and they had taken a protective role over her helping her on multiple occasions and comforting her after the loud and violent fights with her husband. 
inviting her into their flat and offering her tea and sticky buns. Ah, damn. When Beryl hinted that she was planning suicide, the Christies offered to adopt the baby. I'll be like, okay, if you die, we'll take your baby. Jesus. I mean, I, I imagine they might have tried to talk her out of it first. Right. But it could have been one of those, like, reassure that no matter what happens, your baby will be taken care of. Then, at the brink of the collapsing lives of the young separated couple, Beryl would find out devastating news. She was pregnant again. Beryl desperately did not want another baby. Not now and not with Tim. Mm -hmm. Abortions were illegal and back alley options were dangerous and expensive. Mm -hmm. Confiding in a friend, Joan Vincent, she admitted that a miscarry was the only option and would attempt to this by punching herself in the stomach, binging on gin and overdosing on laxatives. All attempts failed. She grew more desperate and swallowed poisons like Quinine and ergo, ergot? I don't know how to pronounce that, ergot? Syringed herself with glycerine and iodine, as well as attempted to pull the fetus out with a bent coat hanger. See, this is why abortions should not be illegal. Mm -mm. On Monday, November 7th, 1949, Reg would go upstairs to check on his worrisomely quiet barrel. The middle floor neighbor, Mr. Kitchener, had fallen ill and had been taken to the hospital where he had been for the past five weeks. And so the Christies were accustomed to hearing all of the bumps, scrapes, and noises of the Evans flat through the thin floor and walls. He would go and find her lying on a quilt in front of the kitchen fireplace, attempting to gas herself with a rubber tube. He immediately shut it off and opened the window and waited for her to come to. Wow. The next day, he would return to check in on her again, and it was reported that she was ready to kill herself and begged him to help her with an abortion. She offered to do anything in exchange for his help and offered herself on the same quilt. But Reg was unable to have sex with her, not for morals, but because of his inability to perform. Frustrated but obliging, he turned on the gas and held it close to her face. When she became unconscious, he turned the gas off. He tried to have sex with her once more but still wasn't able to. What? So she told him, I'm going to kill myself if I don't get rid of this baby. You have medical experience. Please help me abort it. I will have sex with you if you help me. That's all she had to offer. Later, when Tim came home around 6 p.m., Reg stopped him in the passageway and delivered the bad news. He told him that his wife had committed suicide and gassed herself. Tim pushed inside the flat and saw her lying where Reg had left her. He picked her up and carried her into the bedroom and laid her on the bed, covering her with the quilt. Reg told him that he would no doubt be the main suspect due to their fighting. Tim agreed, and after transporting the body to the currently unoccupied flat of Mr. Kitchener, they hatched a plan to leave her body where it couldn't be found. What's wrong with just saying she committed suicide? There's a question about um, whether he performed the abortion, and abortion's illegal. Got it. But then Tim, he told Tim, you'll be the main suspect for her death. Right. Even if she died of a suicide, everyone has heard you guys fighting and threatening to kill her. Yeah. During this time period, the wash house in the back had been out of order for a while. And with complaints from the tenants, the landlord had finally agreed to have construction men come to rip out the floors and walls to fix the issue. This very evening, the carpenters had just finished the work. And so Beryl's body was moved into hiding under the washroom floor. Afterwards, plagued with guilt, Tim sold his furniture and went into hiding, telling everyone that he had quit his job and moved to Bristol with his wife. His family thought it to be sudden and alarming, but Tim stuck to his story. I thought he didn't have a job. No, I think he just told everyone that he quit his job. Got it. However, after a few days, he came to wonder about his daughter, who had been left in the care of the Christies, who said that they knew a couple who could give her a good home. After weeks of lying about his wife's whereabouts on November 30th, 1949, Tim walked into the local police station and told them his wife, Beryl, had died during a botched abortion. He confessed of disposing of Beryl's body on the grounds in the shared wash house. I have disposed of my wife. I put her down the drain. When the investigators went to search for the body, they would find that the wash house door was stuck Ethel would bring them a piece of metal to try to pry it open. 
Inside, they noticed some pieces of wood around the sink. Behind the panel was a package wrapped in green tablecloth and tied with a cord. When they unwrapped it, a pair of feet slipped out, revealing the decaying corpse of Beryl Evans. A pair mm. of feet? Were they dismembered her? No, I think when they like unwrapped it, her feet were like... Oh, okay. Well, when it says like a package, I think like a small package. <laughs> oh. But her body wasn't the only one recovered. Baby Geraldine's tiny body was also found. Strangled. A man's tie around the baby's neck. Mm, that's so sad. Who the fuck did that? That's so sad. <sighs> Tim was charged with the murder of his wife and daughter, Beryl, and Geraldine Evans. During the interrogations that followed, Tim would insist that he was not the one to have killed her, but was worried about incriminating his neighbor, so he claimed that a stranger had given him something to help Beryl abort the baby. He insisted that he told his wife not to take it, but when he returned home, she was dead. Afraid, he irrationally had decided to dispose of the body. However, when the questioning became more intense, an official confession was documented by the police. In it, Tim admitted in great detail to hitting Beryl in the face during a quarrel over money, then in a fit of temper strangled her. Once dead, he put her into the wash house and used wood to hide the body. It is then written that he said he left his baby home alone for two days before killing her too by strangling her with a rope. However, there were many inconsistencies and contradicted facts that would question if this was an accurate confession. Furthermore, the language that was used in the confession were more sophisticated than what an illiterate man would use. Yeah. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like they made it up. Later, he would once again insist it wasn't him, but this time point the finger at John Reginald Christie. Well, good, because that's who killed your wife. <laughs> You might have been a dick, but you didn't try to fuck a dead person. When Reg was called in for questioning, he responded to Tim's accusation as preposterous and reminded them that Tim was a known liar. He would then recount how violent the marriage had been. The officers would believe him, accepting him as one of their own. Because remember, he was part of the police force. Yeah. Investigators would search the Evans' apartment, now mostly empty at this point, but would find a few unusual items, such as clippings of a newspaper about a sensational murder known as the Stanley Seti case and a stolen briefcase. Pathology reports would show that Beryl had bruises over the lip and right eye. She had been strangled with a cord and rope of some kind, and there was no evidence that she had taken anything to abort her three-month-old fetus. She had been strangled? I thought she was gassed to death. So many mysteries. Okay. The trial was short, lasting only three days, and there was overwhelming witness testimony against him. His legal defense did their best to bring up inconsistencies in the facts and the timeline of his confession, as well as noted that Tim claimed that he would be beat up if he did not confess. One point that was brought up for scrutinization was when the bodies were disposed of, as the dates that were originally given were during the days that construction work in the wash house was still ongoing and certainly the workers would have noticed discarded bodies. Mm -hmm. They also pointed out unbelievable claims such as no one noticing the rancid smell of decomposition for three weeks coming from the only wash house on the premise. It is also likely that Tim himself did not help his own case, easily confused and led by prosecutors. Simple man. After only 40 minutes of deliberation, Timothy John Evans was found guilty of the murders on January 13, 1950. He would attempt a single appeal, but on March 9, 1950, Tim was hanged at Pentonville Prison for the murders. Wow. So what do you think at this point? I don't know. There's so many different versions of what happened. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to think. I have no idea. Okay, because there's more. As you write, the story does not end here. Three years later, John Reginald Christie had gotten fired from his job at the Post Office Savings Bank, where he had worked for the past four years due to disclosures of his past crimes that were shed as a result of the trial. He sank into depression and lost 28 pounds, even seeing a psychiatrist for a three-week observation period. During this time, his relationship with Ethel also became more strained, with her complaining about the Jamaican don't be a racist, Ethel. With her complaining about the Jamaicans who had moved in upstairs and how she detested sharing an outhouse with them and taunting Reg about his impotence more and more. 
Soon, though, things appeared to improve when he found another job as a clerk with the British Road Transport Services. Then, in December 1952, he suddenly put in his resignation, citing he had found a better job in Sheffield. His wife moved first to set up their new life together, as Reg sold off the furniture. People would note that he went to great lengths to clean the place and tidy it up by sprinkling his house and garden with strong disinfectant. Suspicious. <laughs> he moved out on March 20th, the following year, when he noticed a woman, Mrs. Riley, looking for a place to rent. He invited her over to look at his flat. When she arrived with her husband, they decided to take it and offered to pay three months in advance. He took the deal and left, leaving his cat with the new tenants and killing the dog when he did not want to keep him. What? Taxi. Taxi. Oh, it's taxi network. I know. Okay. However, this sub-renting was a violation of his lease, and he was not authorized by the landlord to do so. The new tenants found themselves in the unfortunate situation of getting swindled for rent and they were forced to move out within 24 hours. And now, with an empty flat, the landlord would allow the upstairs tenant who had moved in after Mr. Kitchener passed, Beersford Brown, to use the downstairs kitchen. When he noticed that the flat had a bad smell, mm -hmm. he began to clean things up, and it occurred to him that he wanted to install a shelf on the kitchen wall for his new wireless radio. He knocked on the walls to find the proper spots to place brackets, and discovered a section that sounded hollow. He pulled back some wallpaper and saw that there was a hidden cupboard behind it. When he opened it to take a look inside, Beersford would slam it shut again fast. Inside, he had seen the body of a naked woman. When the police came to investigate, they would uncover three bodies total. The first that he had seen was the woman in a sitting position among some rubble hunched forward with her back to the door wearing only stockings and a garter belt. She had been strangled with a ligature and her hands were tied in front of her with a handkerchief. A second body found in the cupboard was wrapped with a blanket and tied together with stockings. When unrolled, they found that she was placed upside down and her head wrapped in a pillowcase. A third victim was found in a similar manner with her ankles tied with an electrical cord. All of the knots were made with a reef knot, a special knot otherwise known as a square knot that tightens as it pulled, which you would only learn if you were like in the army or something, right? It's a very specific knot. They say that sailors use it, but I would imagine you also learn it like Didn't army Reg military. do the army mm -hmm. stuff? Yeah, yeah. Also, it's just such an eerie way to like set the bodies. Like the two girls that were wrapped up in the blankets, they were stacked against the wall upside down, like the head down, which I don't know. That's a little weird. And then like the first woman had her sitting like this. Right. Yeah, that's fucking weird. Ooh. And how decayed were these bodies? Relatively recently. Oh, okay. So these are new murders. These are not desiccated, dried up bodies. Right. No. When they continued investigating the rest of the house, they would find another body under the floorboards of the main room. Fucking A. And when searching the outside of the house, more bones would be found in the garden, including a human femur and skull bones with teeth, marking two more bodies. In a brazing display of shamelessness, the femur that had been found wasn't even buried, but being used to prop up a broken trellis. I don't want that. <laughs> It's like a horror. It's like an actual haunted house lawn where they put like bones in the front. Uh, and despite skulls. only one skull being found, it is theorized that the second skull was in fact tossed over the fence into a nearby bombed out house that had been destroyed during the war. When it was found charred, there was a great deal of interest in trying to figure out who the incinerated woman was, but it was never found out. So the way he got that second skull, the way it like turned up again, his dog dug it up and brought him the skull. That's why he killed the dog. And so he was just like, oh shit, what do I do with this? It's fucked up. A nationwide manhunt for John Reginald Christie ensued on March 25th, 1953. Three days later, he would call the News of the World. I think it's like a channel or something. It's called the News of the World. I'm calling the News of the World. <laughs> <laughs> and arranged to meet with a reporter, offering an exclusive interview. But the meeting never took place as he became frightened of the two officers who arrived to meet the reporters. And what did he think was going to happen? I don't know. He thought he was like some cool serial killer, I guess. 
He had been staying at a local hotel, the King's Cross Roten House, but immediately left, even though he had prepaid for a full week. He wandered around London, sleeping on park benches, and was finally apprehended on March 31st, when he was arrested near an embankment at Putney Bridge. He had initially been asked his identity by a, police, by a police officer, to which he answered, John Waddington, wait, <clears throat> John Waddington from 35th Westbourne Grove. <laughs> I'm so good at that. But the officer recognized him and asked, you are Christie, aren't you? Oh, wow. Mm. The, well, his face was everywhere. In the 50s? He was on, like, the I guess, newspapers. His nasty and... face. Uh-huh. Reg gave up and admitted he was Christy. On him was an ID card that confirmed this, hmm. conveniently, <laughs> as well as a ration book, his union card, an ambulance badge, and an old newspaper clipping about the remand of Timothy Evans. She don't want to give you food no from her mouth. She's not going to stay kiss here you. and hang out. I'll scratch, scratch your necks, but I don't want tongue and face. No. You lick your butt with that tongue. Yeah. He licked my tongue with his tongue today on accident. Oh. Yeah, it was gross. Yeah, it was gross. gross. Dexter, stop. Yeah. We're all looking at you because you're not listening. No. Respect her boundaries. John Reginald Christie had finally been apprehended. Mm. Once interrogated, he confessed to multiple murders, including that of his wife. Oh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> His first victim was Ruth First, whom he impulsively strangled during sex in August of 1943. Oh, that would be... Okay, first of all, that would be a horrible way to die. Like, thinking you're just having sex with someone, and then they just are, like, strangling you, and you're like, oh, what a cool kink. But then they're, like, really strangling you, (laughs) and you're like, oh, my God, like, what are they doing? They don't even know what they're doing because they've never done it before. Yeah, there's no safe word for that. Jesus. She was a 21-year-old Austrian who had recently moved to England, when he met her at a bar. Tall and full of life, he struck up an affair with her when Ethel was away visiting her family in Sheffield. When he was surprised by a telegram announcing that Ethel was on her way home, Ruth had asked him to run away with her, but he refused. Instead, he strangled her right there as they had sex, wrapped her up, and stored her under the floorboards before they arrived. The next day, when Ethel left for work, he moved Ruth into a hole in the garden. And that's where she was found. So she's the bones that they found. Yeah, she's, she's one the of first the one. Mm-hmm. So she's from seven years ago. Right. And or she's just bones ago. now because it's yeah. 1943. Ten years ago. Okay. Right. So he's just like, hi, honey, you're home. There's like a body under the floor. Then in October 1944, he murdered a colleague, Muriel Amelia Edie, 32, who worked in the assembly department of a radio factory where Reg worked. They hit it off in the canteen, and she would become a friend of the Christie's. Going out together in a group to the movies or coming by for tea together served by Ethel. Muriel suffered from chronic bronchitis. And one weekend when Ethel was again away in Sheffield, he offered for her to come over so that he could help treat her with a special mixture medicine. He informed her that he had first aid experience with the war reserve and had made a remedy. When she came over, he gave her an inhaler. This was secretly tubed to a gas line and the jar was treated with a tincture to prevent it from smelling like gas. She willingly began to take deep breaths in of the carbon monoxide and quickly became weakened. Then he choked her to death and raped her dead body. The necrophiliac. Both Ruth Fierst and Muriel Edie's bodies were found in the garden. The body found under the floorboards belonged to that of his wife, Ethel. When he had claimed she had moved first to Sheffield on the morning of December 14, 1952, he told the police that he had actually woken up to her moving around in bed, her face blue and choking. He recalled thinking it was too late to call for help, and when he could no longer bear her suffering, he got a stocking and strangled her. Afterwards, he noticed an empty bottle of sleeping pills that were prescribed for his insomnia and concluded that she had taken them to kill herself. He said that he left her in the bed for two or three days in a daze. (laughs) Three days in a daze. When he decided to place her under the loose floorboards in the house, I thought it was the best way to lay her to rest. As I fucked and raped more victims above her, basically. Afterwards, he forged her signature on a banknote and cleared out their bank account. He also pawned his wife's wedding ring, his watch, and wedding band. He would continue to forge letters to her sister claiming that her handwriting was different due to her worsening rheumatism. That Christmas,
Christmas. He sent a few gifts signed from Ethel and Reg. After February, though, he would stop bothering to answer letters from relatives inquiring about his wife. He kept the act up for a minute. Uh, I don't know. He's super terrible. Between January and March of 1953, just before moving, he would murder three more women. Kathleen Maloney, 26, Rita Nelson, 25, and Hectorina McLennan, 26, who were all prostitutes, whom he invited back to his home at 10 Reelington Place. Pathology tests would reveal carbon monoxide in their bodies. These murders would also justify as not his fault. Since they were women of disrepute, and as a man of virtue, had no choice but to do what he did. So because they were prostitutes, mm-hmm. he can kill them? Well, that's a common theme with serial killers, isn't it? They believe that that's their duty. They're not doing... Oh, I. you know what? I just misinterpreted it. He justified it that way. I thought the mm-hmm. court applauded. I was like, what the fuck? All right. Mm-hmm. The next day, he was charged with his wife's murder. On April 15th, he was charged with murdering the three prostitutes. In prison, several psychiatrists would examine Reg Christie, and he was described as nauseating mm-hmm. and sniveling. Mm-hmm. He disassociated when describing his deeds and talked about himself in the third person. He would boast about his kills to other inmates. Reg stated that his goal had been 12. He would, however, always deny killing Baby Geraldine. Which is interesting. What, you can't you can't be a baby killer? What, is that suddenly, like, way worse than just killing in general? Who the fuck killed her? Mm-hmm. He would put in a plea of insanity, with his own attorney calling him a maniac and madman. The defense would concur. Professionals would weigh in, stating that he had a hysterical personality of neurosis, but without any defect of reason. His actions after murder to hide the body was indicative of knowing wrongdoing. Ultimately, he was found fit to stand trial, which began on June 22, 1953, and in the same court where Timothy Evans had been tried years ago. His trial would also be similarly short. It lasted only four days, and it took the jury only one hour and 22 minutes to deliberate before finding him guilty of murdering his wife. He accepted the verdict and did not appeal the death sentence. He knew he wasn't going to yeah. fight it. He was just like, yep. He was hanged on July 15th, 1953 at Pentonville Prison on the same gallows as Timothy Evans. Timothy Evans was granted a posthumous pardon in 1966 for the murder of his wife. <laughs> well, he was dead, so... Yeah, like, but they still kept the uh, murder of Geraldine. Shortly after Christie's arrest in 1953, Mm -hmm. the place was renamed Runton Close in a bid to shake off the past. But being a combination of a rat-infested slum and with the taboo being the former home of a serial killer, the building was flattened in 1978. It's not there anymore. No building was built on top of the site, but rather a partially paved garden now called Bartle Close and Andrews Square. Dang, that's literally just the size of a tree, and then and mm-hmm. so many things happened. So many bodies. Human beings are fucked up. So that's it's sad. Mm-hmm. But it's also fascinating. I get why you refer to it as the place because all these terrible things happened in this place. Did he ever explain what he really did to Beryl? No. The autopsy results show that she was beaten showed that she was strangled, and they showed her vaginal area had bruising also. Because he's a necrophiliac. They didn't do like a semen test or anything like that. There's a lot of criticism actually about the police handling the investigation of Farrell's death. They didn't do a lot of stuff. Properly like interview or search the grounds. I mean, they could have found so many of the... Like the bone of Ruth was just used as like a prop against the fence. Yeah. I just think of, like, this is the 40s and 50s. It's just a different time. And I just wonder, like, why would Ethel stay with this guy, you know? And it just seems like there was nothing redeeming about him. But he was able to pull all these young women. But I thought he was But a lot of these women were prostitutes. But not the Austrian girl. There was uh, speculation that she might have been kind of side hustling as a prostitute. And he, she might have been fronting as an escort at the bar that he met her in. Okay, because I'm like, he was not nice looking. I mean, he got a bad temper. The kind of man that would need to pay a woman mm-hmm. for, for sex. 
during that time period, I'm sure it was just a very difficult time for a unattached woman. Yeah. You know? It did sound like their relationship up until that point, they were just kind of exist coexisting. Yeah. Right? It sounded they were just kind of like resigned to this is the arrangement. Yeah. But after Beryl died, their relationship deteriorated. Remember? Because yeah. he starts like complaining about her more because she's complaining about him more yeah. and they're fighting more and there's a lot of questions poked about how much did ethel know about beryl's death yeah because i mean you can't ask her because she's dead yeah and they didn't come to suspect him until after all the bodies were yeah. found so yeah there's no way to know but she seemed like she was more irritated the only other person living in that building at the time was ethel because Kitchener had died, Beryl and Geraldine are gone, and then Tim has skedaddled. So in those three weeks of the body in the bathroom, like, rotting, the defense attorney was like, how come nobody complained about it? How come nobody noticed? Why did Ethel not say anything right. if she didn't know? Right. If she wasn't covering it up? Right. They think that she definitely was in on it, and maybe her death was closing up loose ends. You know, clearly he didn't care for her. No, he did not. He had no respect for life. You Who know? killed the baby? I think he did. I think he did too. I think he just like, for whatever reason, didn't want to admit that he killed the baby. Mm, because there's another part where it says that Tim, before he went to the police, he actually came back to ask about like, where's where's Geraldine? Like, I, I'm ready to take, like, I don't know if he said I'm ready to take her, but he was inquiring about her. And he had told him that she, he had like given the baby to the home that he was telling him about. So that worked against him too, because then they're like, oh, you know, they always return to the scene of the crime. So that made his case like that also. Tim had confessed that he strangled the baby with rope, but it was a tie. The tie belonged to Mr. Kitchener, but he wasn't in the house at the time. They took the body together and he gave the baby to Ethel. He gave and the Reg. baby to Ethel and Reg. And then he left. Yeah, I think Ethel and So Reg. Ethel and Reg could have just gone in and taken one of his ties and died. I don't think Ethel fact. killed anyone. I think Reg killed mm -hmm. this baby because I think Ethel wanted Ethel probably wanted, wanted a baby. baby. Mm -hmm. And Reg was like, Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll kill this little thing that keeps screaming. Mm hmm And that's probably the thing that broke Ethel's back and was just like, you know what, that's it. Can't do this no more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the confession was totally fabricated and made up. Because they, they were also saying, like, if he left the baby alone for two days and the baby is, like, screaming and crying this whole time, Ethel for sure would have come up yeah. to, like, get the baby. Yeah. So, mm. abortion. <laughs> I, I think, like, what we heard in the story was that Beryl would have made different choices if she was able to abort this baby. Yeah, if she could have just gotten rid of the baby because it didn't fit into her finance or her life or her relationship with Tim anymore. Or, and she mentally wasn't stable enough she to handle happy. the challenge. Right. So, look, I think when someone decides they're going to have an abortion, there's so many things that come into play. And mm -hmm. the, I think the most important one is a mental and emotional stability because to have a baby and bring someone into your world... You have to be ready to handle it. Oh, yeah. You're and if responsible you're responsible for that life. If you're not, then you're mm -hmm. creating this really terrible situation for a lot of people, right. potentially. Right. And not a good environment for that kid to grow up with yeah. everything they need to be successful. Yeah. yeah. We see it all escalated. Mm -hmm. She got murdered by her neighbor. It, she could have had a bad end even before that with all of her attempts to miscarry. Yeah. When, when when someone's desperate enough to not want that child, illegalizing abortion isn't necessarily going to stop them from trying. Oh, yeah, no. And that's It's just making it more in. dangerous, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because human beings, you know, we are very uh, determined, persistent, resilient creatures. Mm -hmm. And when we, like, want something, we want it. Right. And or in the opposite... When we don't want something, she know? wants an abortion. Right, because she, she wants, doesn't want the baby. Yeah. It's, yeah. Clearly, this guy saw an opportunity to take advantage of her because he was like, I know medical things. And the way that she, she was killed, him. Um, uh, the strangulation, when the pathology reported it, like, that's not how he reported that she no. died. He said um, she was gassed. But then also, strangling was kind of his MO. Yes, All that of his, his other victims yeah, were strangled. That was his thing. Did she get bruises before or after mm -hmm. being alive? Oh, if she had bruises, it would be like while she was still alive. 
You can't bruise after you die? No, because bruising happens when the blood goes into a certain layer of the skin. Oh. And you need capillaries that flow blood for that. Got it. I just figured there's blood in your veins and they can burst. Well, there's a, there's a difference between like a, like a pool of blood versus a bruise. Sure. Yeah, like bruises okay. like capillaries. She's the doctor here. I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> Forensics. Fine. Yeah. There's you know, another a potential victim, Mrs. Riley. Remember the subletter who only stayed there oh, for yeah. 24 hours with her yeah, husband? Yeah, yeah. So the theory is that he met her some random place and was like, oh yeah, I've got a house to rent. You should come over. Right. They're speculating that she was supposed to be another right. victim. But because her boyfriend or husband, right. her husband came yeah. with her, he was like, oh yeah, this is the house. Offered to take it right then and there and gave him money cash. And he was like, all right, well, I guess this is my chance to get the fuck out of yeah. here. You know? Yeah, I was thinking that the way you wrote it made it seem that way. And these are just the bodies in this house. Yeah, we don't know. You know, Thomas was a dick, but it sucks that he got hung for something he didn't do. Yeah. I mean, he was a dick, but he was like a liar. Mm -hmm. He was a liar, and he was a drinker, and he was a gambler. Yeah. You know? He sucked, but... He wasn't a killer. Not death penalty sucked. By the reveal that he's a serial killer. All we know mm -hmm. is that he's a murderer. The way that Beryl painted the picture of him. So all of the um, descriptions of Beryl about everyone else, because obviously she's the first who died. She has a brother, and the brother wrote a book. And he's he's a couple years younger yeah, than her. I was her. wondering how you had all these reports. And so he would say how he would go and visit his sister. Uncle Reg would be so nice. They would let him in. They'd play cards together. They were so nice. And his sister so adored weird. them. So it's such a contrast to how he Killed her. secretly was. Yeah. She mm -hmm. probably genuinely trusted him until that very last yeah. second. What a wild case. <laughs> Spooky. Okay, kids. Well, uh, thank you for tuning in for another delightful story with two girls and one crime. Mm, that cup. <laughs> Try not to trust your neighbors. No. Yeah. <laughs> no trick or treating, kids. No. <laughs> Subscribe if you haven't already. Like. Turn your notifications. Yes, notification reminder. And check out our other episodes. We have 20 something episodes posted. <laughs> We're still going. I have no idea how many. Like 30, maybe? I don't know. A lot. A lot. A lot. Ah. All right, guys. Well, good night. Good night. See you the next time. Happy Halloween. Stay safe, kids. Happy Halloween. Bye. Bye. Doobie doobie doo!